What you're going to get now today is, you might say, my basic spiel about uh, global poverty and what are the obligations of the affluent in the face of global poverty. Um, but this is only the first lecture, as I said, in this topic, so we're going to be able to go into things more deeply in some of the coming lectures, and we're going to have visitors who are going to help us with those topics. So um, there'll, be, there'll be gaps in what I say today which will get filled in. For many years now, I've uh, started talking about this topic by asking people to imagine a little story that goes like this. So you're walking through a park, and this park has a shallow ornamental pond. Uh, you know that it's shallow because you've walked through it and you've seen kids playing in it. Maybe it's the pond at, where is it, over there, outside the uh, Robertson Hall, the Woodrow Wilson Center. You see kids playing it in summer. Um, so you're walking over there, uh, and when you see something splashing in the pond, and when you look more closely, you see that it's a small child who's fallen in, and even though that pond is very shallow, it's too deep for this child to stand up. So it looks like this kid is in danger of drowning. The first thing you probably do is to look around and say, who's looking after this child? There must be some parents or a babysitter somewhere, but unusually that area is completely free of anyone else. You don't see anyone else, you don't know what's happened, but there's nobody else there around. So your next thought is, well, I better jump into the water and pull that child out. But before you can do that, another less noble thought occurs to you. That is, that you've put on your most expensive pair of shoes and maybe other clothing that uh, is going to get ruined by wading into that water. Let's assume the pond is not quite as clean as the one over there um, by Robertson Hall usually is. Let's assume it's a, it's a rather muddy sort of pond. So the kind of clothes you're wearing are, are not going to really do well getting immersed in this muddy water. You're going to have to replace your shoes at some significant expense. Maybe you're going to have to go back to where you live and change your clothes because you don't want to walk around in wet clothes all day and you've got other things to do. It's generally going to be a nuisance and it's going to cost you some money. So given that, perhaps the thought occurs to you, I don't really have any responsibility for this child. This is not my child. And I didn't push the child in the pond, or I wasn't even asked to look after this child. I have no responsibility for this child and no causal connection with the child being in the pond. So since it's going to be inconvenient to me and it's going to cost me something to um, actually pull this child out of the pond, maybe I'll just forget about it and go on my way. So let me ask you a question. If you did do that, if you said this child is not my responsibility, there's some cost to me in pulling the child out, so I'm going to go on my way, would you be doing something wrong? Put your hands up if you think you would be doing something wrong. Okay, I see a lot of hands going up. Put your hands up if you think you would not be doing something wrong. I don't see any hands. Occasionally I get somebody who is committed to being an individualist who will put their hand up. Um, but, but I think the overwhelming view is, in our community anyway, when I've asked a variety of different audiences, sometimes students, sometimes uh, audiences from not connected with universities, um, the overwhelming verdict is what you just saw. People think you would be doing something wrong if you didn't pull this child out and rescue this child. Well, can we generalize from that in some way? A lot of people say, what this illustrates is something called the rule of easy rescue. If you can easily rescue someone at modest cost to yourself, you ought to do it. It's wrong not to do it. 
it's not just that it would be nice to do it. That's easy. And it's not just that it would be something good to do, but it's actually that it would be wrong not to do it. That you would have done something that goes below the minimum that we think is required for right conduct. Well, if that's so in this case, is there a parallel with other situations that we're in? And in particular, is there a parallel with the situation of the affluent as compared to those in extreme poverty? Let's have a look at this situation for a moment. On the one hand, who do I mean by the affluent here? Well, I mean people who have enough income or enough wealth so that they can meet all of their needs for food, shelter, clothing, health care. Um, they have children to educate their children and make reasonable provision for the future. Things could always go wrong. You could always lose your job. Maybe you work for the US government and it might be shut down. Um, so you want to make some provision for the future as well. But even after you've done that, you still have enough to spend on things that by no stretch of the imagination are really needs. And that's a huge range of things. At the one end, it can be things that are expensive, big ticket items, might be uh, taking an expensive vacation abroad. Um, and at the other end, it might be quite small things individually that nevertheless add up over the year. Think, for, for example, how much do you spend on buying things to drink? Well, since the water that comes out of the tap here is safe to drink, even if it's not the most delicious water in the country, but it's safe to drink, so really everything that you spend on something to drink is a luxury. It's not a necessity. And that's whether it ranges from bottled water to sodas to coffees. Um, well, you might think you need some coffee to get through the night to get your paper done because you left it too late. Um, but generally speaking, this is, this is not a need either. And so all of those things are things that we can we can do without if we want to. They're, they're optional expenditures for us. And then, of course, in between, there's things like clothes, when our clothes have not worn out, but we're just tired of them, um, and uh, uh, you know, going to concerts or whatever that might be. All of those things are things that couldn't really be regarded as necessities. So I assume that we're all in that situation. We're all spending money on things that are not necessities. And that puts us in what I'm going to refer to as uh, the affluent class. Speaking, and I'm speaking globally here. So globally, there's more than a billion people who are like us in that respect, who are affluent. Maybe it's one and a half billion, some, something in that order. And then if we look at the other end of the spectrum. The World Bank says that there are over a billion people who live in extreme poverty. The World Bank defines extreme poverty as not having enough to reliably meet your basic needs. So not enough income to reliably meet those needs that I mentioned for uh, you may not reliably have enough food for yourself and your family, uh, you may not have uh, enough to send your children even to complete primary school, uh, you may have nothing that you can spend on, on health care and no access to free health care. Um, and uh, you're unlikely to have safe drinking water in your home. You may not have even sanitation in your home. So a lot of basic necessities and uh, are missing. And um, the World Bank says that, that currently calculates that level of income that you can meet those necessities 
by a, a rather complicated formula which you might see stated as the purchasing power equivalent of $1.25 US per day. So that needs a little bit of explanation. Firstly, um, what we're talking about is not what $1.25 US would buy if you went to that country and you gave it to a bank and you said, give me local currency for this. Because if you've travelled in developing countries, you will know that your US dollars go quite far. They go much further than they do in this country. Prices are low once you convert at, a, at the rates of foreign exchange. But the World Bank says purchasing power equivalent. So it's not talking about that. It's talking about how much $1.25 US buys in this country and the equivalent amount in the foreign currency, in the currency where people live in the developing world, uh, that, that buys the equivalent of what $1.25 buys in this country. So it's much less than $1.25 at foreign exchange equivalents. On the other hand, it's also true that the World Bank is talking in $1993. So that makes a variant in the other direction, because of course we've had significant inflation since 1993. Perhaps $1.25 dollars 1993 may be worth something around $2 today. So you could think of this as the purchasing power equivalent in these countries of $2 US per day, what you can get for $2 today. But it's obvious still firstly that it's very little and secondly that the discrepancy between our income and theirs is huge. And this makes a difference in terms of how much the relatively small amounts that I mentioned that we might spend on things we don't need, how much difference they could make to people elsewhere. Because the cost of, of that latte, perhaps, that you're buying on Nassau Street um, might be more than the daily income of people living in extreme poverty. So something that to you is fairly minor is more than they have, perhaps even than the whole family has if there's only uh, one breadwinner to live on for a day. So there's a very big difference. And the next question is, what does that difference actually mean in terms of these people's lives? Well, it means obviously that they can't take for granted the things that we have, that if they become ill or their children become ill, they may not be able to get any health care, that uh, they may not be able to send their children to school, that they may be hungry or there may be times of the year in which they're hungry. They may not be hungry all year round, but there may be a time of the year when they're waiting for the next harvest to come in, when they're short of food, they have to cut down on food, they go to bed hungry. It means that their life expectancy is much less than ours. So whereas ours is now in the high 70s or around 80, depending whether you're male or female. Um, in many developing countries, it's around 50. So there's a big difference in how long people live. And that's particularly reflected in the rate of child mortality. So UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Foundation, recently published, just last month, published its report on <coughs> child mortality in the year 2012. Child mortality means children who die before their fifth birthday. It said that 6.6 .6 million children died in the world before they reached their fifth birthday in 2012. And it said that this is good news. Why is it good news? It's good news because the number has been falling year after year since the 1990s. And this 6.6 .6 million is again down on the previous year when it was 6.9 million. So it's a significant drop. And if you look back to 1990, child mortality was then estimated at 12 million. So considering that the world's population has increased quite dramatically since uh, 1990, the proportion of children under five dying has fallen even further than the difference between 12 and 6.6, .6, which is already close to a 50% decline, and obviously as a proportion it's declined more than that. So that is good news. But 
it still means that 6.6 .6 million children are dying, and they're not dying because they contract some strange disease that we don't know how to cure. They're dying from quite simple diseases, uh, for example, from diarrhea, which we can prevent if we can provide safe drinking water, and if we, when it does occur, we can very easily and cheaply cure by a simple mixture of, of salts and water called oral rehydration therapy, but you have to get this to all of the rural villages where these deaths occur, and you have to educate people on how to use it, so it takes a bit of effort. Uh, these children also die from measles because still not all children are being immunized against measles, although one of the big factors in why child deaths have been dropping is the campaign to immunize children against measles and other childhood diseases. So that's making progress, but not fast enough. And they die from malaria, which we can also prevent by providing bed nets. And again, we have had success in reducing the number of children dying from malaria because of efforts to distribute bed nets, but there are still children dying from malaria. So while we're making progress, 6.6 .6 million children dying from preventable causes is surely far too many. If you think of it, because that's a very big figure, you think of it on a daily basis, it's 18,000 children dying every day. Imagine that all those children were over there in the Princeton Stadium. They wouldn't quite fill it. I think the capacity is a little more than that, but they would, they would pretty, come pretty close to filling it. Imagine that, and imagine that um, for some reason, unless people helped them, unless people gave them support, they would all die by midnight. Well, obviously that would be a major news story of the day, uh, and uh, everybody, or you know, huge numbers of people, would rush to provide assistance to them, and those deaths would be averted. I think we can be quite confident about that. But the facts that I've just been giving you are not major news headlines. Even the UNICEF report um, barely made the news. You had to look quite hard to find a, a news item about it. And that was just, that's just something that happens one day each year when they release that report for the previous year. The rest of it, the, these deaths, are just part of the background. They're part of what we take as normal, and we don't do anything about it. So the question I'm asking now is, in this situation, is there a, a parallel here between our situation with regard to the children who are dying, or adults who are dying, because adults die as well from poverty-related causes, is there a parallel between the child in the pond and our situation with regard to people in extreme poverty? It seems that to some extent there is, there is a parallel. So here's some points of analogy. There's a child who dies, and we could have rescued that child at some modest cost to us. There are children who die, as I've said, and it seems plausible, I'm going to have to look at this more closely, but it at least seems plausible that there are things that we could do to help them. For example, as I said, we are already helping, we're making a difference, but with more resources we could expand immunization against measles, we could provide more clean drinking water, we could distribute bed nets in places that, where malaria is, is rife but they still don't have them. So at least it seems prima facie that there are things we could do, and that the cost of doing these things maybe is not all that dif different from the cost of replacing your expensive shoes or some other clothes, whatever it might be. And again, we can look in more detail at, at what those costs are. So that seems to be part of the parallel. Now we know about this, of course. The children are not in front of us, but we know about this, or anyway, now you all know about it. And um, if you're not doing something to help, then 
are you in a similar situation to the person who didn't want to have the expense and inconvenience of saving the child and therefore walked on? So that's the case for saying there is a parallel here. There is some analogy between the two cases and might be the case that what we are doing or not doing with respect of helping the global poor is not that different from the person who walks past the pond. 